Welcome to the last episode of this month, I think. Yeah, well, we might have, we have one more this month, I guess. Anyway, I'm kind of bummed out. Hell, I'm really bummed out. What am I talking about? You know, first I get forced out of my house because I don't have enough money to pay the $7,000 tax. I have to sell it for a, a fraction of what it's worth. And then I take the money that's left and I go to uh, buy a, a floating home. The perfect location right at 33rd Marino, Marine Drive where I've been taking all those pictures that you guys have been seeing. I go through the pro purchase process. It was supposed to be completed yesterday. It would have been, except for one minor detail. McCuddy's won't let anybody live in it. How about that? So I'm asking everybody out there, do you know anybody that's had a bad experience with McCuddy's Marina? Do you know anybody that's had a really bad experience with boats or floating homes in the same category? Well, contact me. Write me at 251omega at comcast.net. I'd sure like to put on an expose to show how cruel they were to an old man's retirement dreams. So anyway, what was left but just going out and taking pictures again that gets me by. So here's some of the pictures I took that day that I finally had to give up the idea of that floating home. Yeah, it was, it was a pretty unique picture of geese. You know, nicely detailed and everything. You don't usually get him to pose for you like that. And yeah, he jumped into the water right as he saw me. But he still is really good photograph material. And then there were other types too. I think this is a scotter, American scotter. I, I might get. I might be wrong. I'm not a bird expert, but anyway, I, this bird supposedly doesn't have webbed feet, and he's out there swimming around anyway. We got a better view of him coming up, but it was really nice the way the water reflected everything that day. Here's that guy. You get to see his big red eye and a lot of detail in the feathers on, on his back. It's really fine little feathers. Then we're back to the geese again. They moved on to another location. They had found a little island out there and they posed just nicely for me in the next shot. Yeah, there they are, and uh, I kind of went around to the side for a better view, and yeah, he, we're kind of stuck with the format that I had, but they're fixing that now, so you can see the top of their head, but this was done in 4x3 format, and you can see the nice reflection of the geese, and, and then that night I came back, took some pictures, that's a little bit on the blurry side, but we'll go to the next one, and you can see that the sun was setting and the lights were on in Vancouver and the f f that lights on the left side there with a little patch of green is from the uh, I-5 bridge going from Oregon on your left side to Vancouver, Washington on the right side. And there's a more close-up view, an airplane coming in. The, the next shot is a better one. Yeah, this shows, it, you know, actually I was thinking of submitting this to uh, YouTube and with a caption, Nibiru sighted after sunset. Only I'd need two of them, so I have another one coming in here. Well, I don't know if I have the double in this view somewhere, but there were two planes coming into the airport at once, and it looks like twin suns. And, you know, it would be something that you'd see reflected all over the Internet <laughs> by the Nibiru nutcases. Okay, so anyway, uh, I think that's about it, isn't it? Yeah, that's it, so... You know, I, I I find beauty in every little bit that I can, and that's what gets me by. But in the meantime, we're getting back more serious stuff again. Here's a, a cut from James Corbett, who's he lives in Japan right now, and then of course he's in partnership with James Evans Pilato from Media Monarchy here in Portland, Oregon, and I. I don't know if, if James Evan Pilato knows that I'm rebroadcasting his stuff, but I have permission to do it from uh, James Corbett. And I'm sure they'd be happy to see that it got some television time. And uh, it turned out that, you know, just recently we had the anniversary of Fukushima, actually just before my last show, but I was already packed up with stuff. So we're going to cover a little bit of this. So th this clip that we're going to watch is, uh, you know, the fourth year after Fukushima, you know, which is... We're all worried about nuclear war. Well, we're having a continuing nuclear war going on right there, if you really look at it.
Welcome back to Asia Pacific Perspective. I'm one half of your dynamic duo of co-hosts, James Corbett of CorbettReport.com. And I'm Brock West, the other half of apparently a dynamic duo uh, from APPerspective.net. And James, uh, we are in March now in about the second or third but second or third week of March, and of course that means the um, anniversary of the Japanese uh, earthquake and tsunami uh, has come and gone. We will get to that in our second segment, but first we wanted to cover a very important development that's uh, taking place right now, and we will take this one from ChannelNewsAsia.com with the headline reading, Australian Government to Consider Joining China-Backed Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank. Australia expects to make a decision within weeks on whether it will seek to join a China-backed Australian Asian Inf Infrastructure Investment Bank, the Prime Minister Tony Abbott said on Saturday, March 14. Australia's decision on whether to become a founding member of the institution risks upsetting either key strategic allies in the United States and Japan or top trading partner China. However, Britain this week said it has sought to become a founding member of the AIIB because it was in its national interests making it the first Western nation to embrace the institution, which would finance infrastructure projects in the Asia-Pacific. Our position all along has been that we are happy to be part of something which is a genuine multilateral institution such as the World Bank and such as the Asia Development Bank. What we are not prepared to do, however, is sign on to something which is just an arm of one country's foreign policy, Abbott told Sky News, and I almost choked on my Vegemite sandwich when I heard that one, James. Um, we're looking at quite, we're looking very carefully at this and we'll make a decision in the next week or so. I would like to think that it is possible for this to be a genuine multilateral institution. And I think it could be well, it, it could well be an important part of bringing China fully into that international community. 21 countries were represented at the announcement of the bank last October. And China said earlier this year that the, that the number of founder members had risen to 26. But Japan, Australia and South Korea are the notable absentees in the region, having held back ahead of the March 31 deadline, with Australian media, media stating that Washington had put pressure on Canberra to stay out. Also, it is worth men mentioning, James, that just recently France, Germany and Italy have all agreed to follow Britain's lead and join this AIIB infrastructure bank over the last couple of days. So am I right in thinking that much of this finger wagging and disapproval by the US is just a bit of uh, grandstanding? When in reality, America, Europe, China, Russia are much more similarly are much more similar than what's commonly perceived, uh, especially when it comes to financial institutions. If there's one thing we know about modern day superpowers is that they're good at setting up these large monolithic banking structures for all their bankster buddies to orchestrate behind. So, James, you've got BRICS, the IMF, and now the AIIB. Are they all pieces of the same pie, or is there much more under the surface that's worth keeping an eye on? Well, speaking of China and the New World Order, speaking of three-dimensional chess, this is exactly what we see unfolding right now. And there are elements here of different groups that are vying for different uh, positions in that New World Order global in f uh, financial structure. And I think that they are, those interests are opposed. But at the end of the day, they're, they're going for the same thing. I mean, it's just a question of who's going to control the global pie once the glo global pie is consolidated or baked together. So I think there are genuine elements of the American oligarchy that is un concerned about what's happening with the AI AIIB, but only because it's not the type of global, uh, global structure that they want to build. It's the same thing at the end of the day, though, at the end of the day. So... Um, Take a look, for example, The Economist just had an article up about Britain joining this AIIB as a founding shareholder, um, talking about, you know, how how really important this is. And I hope people do take a second to actually reflect on this story, because I think there were some tectonic shifts going on uh, here. And the Financial Times, the uh, Rothschild mouth mouthpiece, quoted a anonymous American official as saying that America is wary about a trend toward constant accommodation of China, which is not the best way to engage a rising power. Very interesting statement, especially because, as The Economist notes, cynical Britons might point out that that strategy worked well enough a century ago when Britain was the incumbent power and America was on the rise. But that is not an analogy that will go down well in Washington. Or at any rate, 
in that uh, two-dimensional chess game where there are actual nation states that are vying for power. But as we know, as we've talked about before, there's a three-dimensional structure here where the oligarchy doesn't give a flying you-know-what about any individual nation state. They are looking to consolidate the global pie. The AIIB is one example of how China is putting their uh, their foot in, into that uh, door jam and trying to trying to wedge their way inside. Uh, the CIPS that I wrote about recently, the SWIFT alternative, is another aspect of that. The New Development Bank, then. Welcome back to Asia Pacific Perspective. I'm one half of your dynamic duo of co-hosts, James Corbett of CorbettReport.com. And I'm Brock West, the other half of apparently a dynamic duo uh, from APPerspective.net. And James, uh, we are in March now in about the second or third about the second or third week of March. And of course, that means the um, anniversary of the Japanese uh, earthquake and tsunami uh, has come and gone. We will get to that in our second segment. But first, we wanted to cover a very important development that's uh, taking place right now. And we will take this one from ChannelNewsAsia.com with the headline reading, Australian government to consider joining China-backed Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank. Australia expects to make a decision within weeks on whether it will seek to join a China-backed Australian Asian Inf- Infrastructure Investment Bank, the Prime Minister Tony Abbott said on Saturday, March 14. Australia's decision on whether to become a founding member of the institution risks upsetting either key strategic allies in the United States and Japan or top trading partner China. However, Britain this week said it has sought to become a founding member of the AIIB because it was in its national interests making it the first Western nation to embrace the institution, which would finance infrastructure projects in the Asia Pacific. Our position all along has been that we are happy to be part of something which is a genuine multilateral institution, such as the World Bank, and such a... Okay, uh, <laughs> sorry, uh, our, our, our playback machine seems to think that we needed to start over right in the middle of that. that we, there was no human intervention with that at all. It just happened, and we're going to try to zoom ahead a little bit to... Try to pick it up. Otherwise, uh, we'll resume at our next contact or next clip. But oh man, live cable access! If this wasn't live, you'd we'd you'd never know that happened. Okay, well, if you guys are ready, go for it. Welcome back to New World Next Week. I'm James Corbett of CorbettReport.com. And I'm James Evan Pilato of MediaMonarchy.com. The Obama gang says you can stick your transparency where the sunshine week doesn't shine. But first, a new poll shows C-51 support rapidly declining. So briefly, Bill C-51 is Canada's Anti-Terrorism Act. 2015 meant to fix a bunch of Canadian laws so the populace can be better surveilled. So via our man Dan Dix at Press for Truth, despite various polls and articles coming out to suggest that Canadians are growing in their support for C-51, it looks like the situation is quite the opposite. So following a National Day of Action against Bill C-51 back on March 14th, where thousands of people took to the streets in protest, the results of a new survey suggest that the Canadian people are not buying into the fear rhetoric like the Harper administration would like them to. The forum research poll demonstrated that support for the bill now stands at roughly 45%, whereas earlier polls suggested that approval was around 82%, and that approval is expected to drop even further. From law professors and former Canadian prime ministers to security experts and human rights advocates, many good people in Canada are concerned about the bill and about the sanctity of due process in the country, a value which C-51 would aim to erode. So unfortunately, as Dan Dix notes, one of the biggest obstacles in getting people to appreciate the fruitlessness that is Bill C-51 is that fear resides in many people's lives. Even though many people don't feel confident about the bill, the same poll showed that two-thirds of the people still think we should give the cops the power to investigate terrorism in any way they see necessary. They believe this despite there being any evidence to suggest or demonstrate how giving them even more power than they already have would make them do a better job than they're already doing right now. So one of the clear reasons that people feel like giving more power to the police is because of the ISIS-induced fear. 
that mainstream corporate media perpetually showing them gruesome murders and bullying them to always live and afraid of some elusive future terror attack. James will include links so people can read more about Bill C-51. Look at all of those day of action protests that happened across Canada. And I guess we'll sort of call this a glass half full story, James. I think that's pretty much the best we can uh, squeeze out of this. It is good to know that people's opposition to C-51 is rising, but exactly as that article notes, it is, of course, framed not only within the Canadian, growing Canadian war on terror uh, propaganda meme that they've been pushing for, for years now, but also, as uh, Dan Dix notes in one of his recent videos, uh, the a lot of the protests are being steered in a a, a left version of the left-right duopoly of uh, of control, so that all of the protests become against anti Harper. Oh, it's you know it's Harper's C fifty one bill. We have to get rid of Harper, and of course we are being set up for the twenty fifteen Canadian election, where the rising star, the Obama of the North, is going to be Justin Trudeau, and uh, that is uh, he's already expressed support for C fifty one. So uh, again, nothing is going to change whatsoever within that phony controlled left-right paradigm in Canada or the U.S. or anywhere else. So I, I think we have to be wary of the way that the opposition to Bill C-51 can be steered into a trap where we're going to get the exact same thing from just a different face of the uh, the, the control grid. Um, so yes, half full in the sense that people are at least wary of what's going on with this bill, um, but there still needs to be more education and they're not People generally aren't going to get it at the types of protests that are going on unless people who do understand what's going on throw themselves into that mix and start informing others about some of this other excluded information about various uh, Canadian terror plots that have been exposed as being uh, a hoax of, a full of a tissue full of lies, um, FBI informants in Canadian terror plots, other types of things that have come out along the way. We'll throw in some uh, links in the show notes so that people can check that out for themselves and as I say, inform others about these issues, because I, I still I still trust that most Canadians, when they really understand the truth, will not go along with either the left or the right arms of this controlled uh, phony opposition. James, did this get built up in that recent Canadian terror attack? Did C-51 sort of rise in, in, in the public's mind after that happened? If I remember correctly, I believe it was retabled in the Parliament just days after that occurred. Or at, at any rate, I remember the stories coming out talking about this bill and why it was so important. So yes, it, absolutely, that gave a little shot in the arm to this whole terror meme. So again, uh, deconstructing the terror myths is an important part of stopping this type Type of legislation from proceeding. Let's continue to deconstruct myths on this 223rd episode of New World Next Week, James. And I think your point about the faces might change, but the the agenda kind of rolls forward. Let's roll forward to our second story this week. White House not subject to FOIA requests anymore. The White House that's back here in the States, in the, the soon-to-be North American Union. The, the White House is removing a federal regulation that subjects its Office of Administration to the Freedom of Information Act, making official a policy under Presidents Bush and Obama to reject requests for records to that office. The White House said the cleanup of FOIA regulations is consistent with court rulings that hold that the office is not subject to the transparency law. The office handles, among other things, White House record-keeping duties like the archiving of emails. But the timing of the move raised eyebrows among transparency advocates coming on National Freedom of Information Day and during a national debate over the preservation of Obama administration records. It's also Sunshine Week. Mar the week of March 16th is always Sunshine Week, an effort by news organizations and watchdog groups to highlight issues of government quote-unquote transparency. The irony of this being at Sunshine Week is not lost on me. It's completely out of step with the president's supposed commitment to transparency. It's a critical office, especially if you want to know, for example, how the White House is dealing with email, said Ann Weissman of the Citizens for Responsibility and Ethics in Washington, or CREW. So you might remember CREW from 2007, and you might remember them from last week's episode of The New World Next Week as we discussed the Bush White House email scandal. That would be when CREW sued 
the White House over emails that they deleted 22 million of them. And the White House and the Bush Cheney crime gang first started to comply with the request, but then reversed course. James, one of the other things we discovered on this Sunshine Week, in addition to not only are they exempting themselves from FOIA requests, but the Obama administration sets even a new record for denying and censoring government files. James, change you can classify. (laughs) Yeah, indeed. And the irony of this occurring in Sunshine Week will not be lost on those long old timers in the crowd who remember that in Sunshine Week 2011, a bunch of government transparency groups, these uh, foundation funded uh, government uh, watchdogs, quote unquote, grouped together to give Obama a transparency award for his commitment to opening up the government. At the last minute, and that that, uh, award was going to be bestowed in Sunshine Week, of course. That uh, appointment was cancelled at the last minute and rescheduled as an off-the-record secret behind-closed-door meeting that Obama granted these uh, government watchdog groups to accept his transparency award. If you want more details on that, I, that was the uh, the issue that I covered in the first ever edition of the Eye Opener Report back in 2011 called Obama's Hypocrisy. And uh, in that note, in that uh, 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 video, we noted the, the some of the people who were involved in giving Obama his transparency award, like Joe Newman of the Project on Government Oversight, who said, I think we've made it clear that the president has shortcomings when it comes to transparency, but I'd also challenge any impartial observer to refute the fact that he has made significant strides in opening up the government, especially when compared to his predecessor. And we had Tom Blanton of the National Security Archive said, I believe their opposition, the people who uh, were against um, this award being given to Obama, I believe their opposition is misplaced and they need to be more precision guided in their advocacy. Know thy enemy. Obama is not their enemy. Um, Well, I would just like to shove those words back in the faces of those foundation uh, f- funded uh, corporate uh, controlled watchdog groups that gave this award to this absolutely ridiculously classified tyrannical regime that has obviously failed to live up to any expectation and trampled all over it exactly as we said they were going to. I wonder if these people will eat crow and realize that they have given an award to one of the most secretive uh, regimes that has ever taken office in the White House, and that's saying something. So, uh, again, it is ridiculous. It is not at all surprising to anyone who has their head screwed on straight, and it needs to be shoved in the faces of the Obama supporters who fell for this crap the first time. So we'll include a couple of related notes, James, I think, that go along with this story, but also, I think, segue us into our third and final story this week. So John Brennan, longtime crony criminal, he's now head of the CIA. He made a note earlier this week, and it was kind of hidden. There was a lot of interesting, big, showy things in the news this week, while some of the more important stories kind of flew under the radar. And again, that's what I think we try and uncover in our own way here. CIA says social media amplifies the terror threat. So what are they going to do? They're going to spy even more on your social media, your Facebook and your tweets and all of that. Again, showing you they'll hide everything from themselves, but ours is all out in the open. And, and, you know, and even as I'm kind of thinking about this, it's always about this sort of misdirection. Because as I'm referring to, you know, kind of the bigger kind of showy stories this week, James, there was this big event where a, a murder was was busted here in the States, a guy named Robert Durst, and he allegedly murdered three people over the course of, of several decades. And he's a bizarro millionaire, and they had been doing this HBO series about him. And lo and behold, they arrest the guy on the night of the season finale of The Jinx on HBO. Amazing timing. And I just found it really interesting how good multinational corporations are showing one nut job who maybe killed three people, but they're not good at exposing institutional murder of millions of people that their own sort of corporations and moves kind of help to kind of push along. So while everybody was talking about the jinx, they weren't noticing that their change alluya savior was making things much, much more secret and essentially deleting emails just like Hillary, just like we talked about last week, James. 
So let's move with having said all that to our third and final story this week, James. I'll file this under our good news. And again, this might be a glass half full. This might be a not unmitigated good, but an interesting one nonetheless. Cisco will start shipping to fake addresses to dodge NSA spies and thieves. This comes via the UK register. Cisco will ship boxes to vacant addresses in a bid to foil the NSA, their security chief, John Stewart, said. The dead drop shipments helped to foil a Snowden revealed operation whereby the NSA would intercept networking kits and install back doors before the boxes reached the customers. So this interception campaign was revealed last May. But speaking at a Cisco Live press panel in Melbourne just this past week, Cisco security head Stewart said they'll ship to fake identities for its most sensitive customers in the hope that the NSA interceptions are targeted. We ship boxes to an address that has nothing to do with the customer, and then you have no idea who it's ultimately going to. When customers are truly worried, it causes other issues to make interception more difficult in that agencies don't quite know where that router is going, so it's hard to target. You'd have to target all of them, and there's always going to be that inherent risk, they noted. Stewart says some customers drive up to a distributor and pick up the hardware at the door. He says nothing could guarantee protection against the NSA. However, if you had a machine in an airtight area, I stop the controls by which I mitigate risk when I ship it, meaning as soon as it leaves the building, well, I can't control what's, what's going to happen to it before it hits the customer. Cisco's poked around its routers for possible spy chips, but to date hasn't found anything because they don't really know what they're looking for. And again, we've reported here in recent weeks about the fact that most of your hard drives already have NSA backdoors kind of put on them. So after this hacking campaign was discovered, Cisco head John Chambers wrote a letter to U.S. President Barack Obama saying the spying would undermine the global tech industry, which is an interesting one and the uh, cart before horse kind of thing, James. Perhaps the global tech industry is built on spying? Uh, yep. Yeah. Basically. Yeah. And and this is one of those stories I would just love to be able to just get someone who's still in this matrix to look at this story and tell me what they think about it. Because to my mind, nothing, literally nothing I can think of is more in your face tyrannical than to have corporations out in the open saying we are doing all of this crazy stuff behind the scenes, this 007 type of stuff to try to avoid the government spying, which we now know and have to admit is going on behind the scenes, but we don't even know what to look for, so we don't know how to change what we're doing. I mean, it's insanity that this is happening and that corporations are at least having to openly address this. Of course, we know that they're still working behind the scenes with the NSA hand in glove, but that's largely because if you try to go against it, like the CEO of Quest, you're going to get thrown in jail for uh, whatever trumped up charges. So it's just, I mean, this is total insanity. This is nightmare tyrannical stuff. And I don't understand. I truly can't imagine how anyone can defend this on anything other than a, oh, but it's only this president. If we just got a new puppet into power, we could, we could solve all of that. Just like getting Obama into power after Bush solved everything, right? Oh, wait, everything continued exactly as before. This is the system writ large. But don't worry, Obama has a solution. I don't know if you saw this, but uh, the latest news, Obama wants to make voting mandatory so boy that'll solve all of america's problems won't it well and just like oregon leads the nation in a lot of ways they have actually just put that in here so when you get a drive it automatically sort of registers you to vote you have to sort of opt out of it now that's an interesting kind of element but it, it is kind of happening we'll see it roll out James, if I can add in sort of other good news notes, and we do try and, and focus on good news here and solutions-oriented elements, and we've upped that game in 2015. And you can submit good news stories to us using hashtag good news next week. Two notes. A bill would give Maine customers a final say on water fluoridation. That was submitted via Real Jack Dallas. And World Changing Me notes that thousands of farmers have been demonstrating in Delhi, India against GM crops and anti-farmer policies. And those protesters are now wondering if Prime Minister Modi maybe came to power with the help of Big Ag. As always, you can submit stories to us via Twitter using hashtag classic. 
New World next week. We'll note Australia joins China's regional bank. Moscow launches a new exchange to fil- facilitate trade between China and Russia. And the Federal Reserve plans their first rate hike since the 2008 controlled demolition of the fake economy. And finally, James, America's most important selection happened this week, as it always does in, in Israel, as both Netanyahu and we even saw the New York Times both backpedaling on their pre-election threats against a Palestinian state. The New York Times published a piece about Netanyahu's racism, then rewrote the whole thing. And you can see those screen grabs. And if you follow Media Monarchy on Twitter and submit stories using hashtag New World Next Week, we can all help share this information, James. That's what it's all about. So le- looking forward to doing it again next week, James. Thank you for your time. Thanks. Okay, now those guys are great. Now that was what we call a stoner alert. Did anybody out there notice that we that, that wasn't about Fukushima? Okay. Well, that was the second clip. We couldn't get the Fukushima clip going, and we'll try to handle that some other show. Um, <clears throat> a lot of subjects got covered there, but the... Uh, Oh, I won't go into them, but we'll, we'll just go on to this next one. It's the, the idea is, years ago, I was really skeptical about the, the, the claims that they were doing geoengineering or chemtrails. Chemtrails, you know, and that put you in a category, if anybody, if you even thought about chemtrails being valid at all, you were classified as a conspiracy theorist, nutcase, tinfoil hat wearer, Somebody that you shouldn't even talk to. Well, then I was listening to Alex Jones. Well, that's another thing. If you listen to Alex Jones, you might not be considered worthy as a human being by some. But uh, unfortunately for them, Alex Jones has a track record that's that's more and more often proving itself. And uh, he was talking about this geoengineering chemtrail thing. And he put out a bunch of patent numbers. He says, you don't believe me? Here, go look up these patents, and you'll see for yourself they have patents for doing this. You you know, they don't just build a machine and put it up there. They patent it so who, somebody's making money on it no matter when or where you see it. So uh, <clears throat> I went and looked up the patents, and sure enough, patents for putting things into the fuel so it would come out the exhaust, and uh, no, the pilots wouldn't even be aware that they were doing it. Uh and, of course, I dropped the idea. I thought, why would anybody do that? They'd be poisoning themselves. Well, the purpose isn't to poison your, themselves. The, the purpose was to prolong the profit-making period. You know, petroleum profits. We, we, they can't have petroleum profits if we tell them to cut back on petroleum burning. It, so what they have to do is prolong the period that it's okay to burn CO2 you know, put it in the atmosphere. It's okay because, look, we've we've delayed the oncoming onslaught of, of climate change by reflecting sunlight into the outer space. Well, anyway, so here's, again, James Corbett and James Evan Pilato from Media Monarchy here in Portland and Corbett in Japan, and they're going to talk about geoengineering. Welcome back to New World Next Week. I'm James Corbett of CorbettReport.com. And I'm James Evan Pilato of MediaMonarchy.com. All your hard drives are belong to NSA. But first, spy agencies fund climate research in hunt for weather weapon. James, this seems like a classic sort of conspiracy theory type episode of the New World Next Week. We'll take this article from The Guardian. A senior U.S. scientist has expressed concern that the intelligence services are funding climate change research to learn if new technologies could be used as potential weapons. Alan Robach, climate scientist at Rutgers in Jersey, has called, a, has called on secretive government agencies to be open about their interest in radical work that explores how to alter the world's climate. Robach, who has contributed to reports for the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, IPCC, uses computer models to study how stratospheric aerosols could cool the planet in the way massive volcanic eruptions do. But he was worried about who would control such climate-altering technologies should they prove effective, he told the American Association for the Advancement of Science in San Jose. 
Last week, the National Academy of Sciences published a two-volume report on different approaches to tackling climate change. One focused on means to remove carbon dioxide from the atmosphere, the other on ways to change clouds or the Earth's surface to make them reflect more sunlight out to space. A report back in 2009 by the Royal Society made similar, similar recommendations. The $600,000 report, the National Academy of Sciences report, was part funded by the U.S. intelligence services. But Robach said the CIA and other agencies had not fully explained their interest in the work. Quote, the CIA was a major funder of the National Academy's report, so that makes me really worried who's going to be in control, Robach said. Other funders included NASA, the U.S. Department of Energy, and NOAA, that's the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. So another way you could put this and summarize it is CIA funding geoengineering to weaponize weather. James? James, this strikes me as one of those types of stories that provides the perfect window into the insane disconnect between reality and actual reality, um, by which I mean there's the reality we're all supposed to believe in, in which weather modification is crazy science fiction stuff. And what are you talking about? That's that's insane. Um, and then there's the reality reality in which not only the CIA, but other various other branches of the U.S. government and uh, one can presume scientific organizations from around the world have been seriously studying this uh, this idea for at the very least, decades. And again, we don't have to speculate about that. There's ample historical uh, documentary evidence of that that we can find in articles like the one that was recently released on activistpost.com by previous Corbett Report uh, guest Peter Kirby entitled Chemtrails Exposed, A History of the New Manhattan the new Manhattan Project, which is a very, very thorough article going through decades and decades of documents talking about s proposals for stratospheric uh, spraying, spraying things in the in the sky, in the clouds, cloud seeding, this type of thing, as uh, as a way of controlling the weather. And in fact, it, as that 1996 uh, U.S. military document, which has become somewhat famous, uh, is called "Weather as a Force Multiplier." owning the weather in 2025. Again, that was from 1996, and there's uh, plenty of other documents like that that have been kicking around for decades. It makes perfect sense that the CIA and every other branch of, of the U.S. government and military would be extremely interested in this technology and would presumably be working on it, and presumably in secret, because they don't want other countries to know about that research. So why on earth should it surprise us that the CIA is suddenly always so interested in climate change and these ideas and funding all of these projects? Of course they have a vested interest in this, but you're not supposed to believe that because that's crazy talk, right? It's crazy talk that they put in, you know, wacky movies and you enjoy it while eating popcorn, but but are laughed at if it's ever brought up in, in, in polite company, as they say. So you said this goes back at least decades. So we'll include a, a flashback to what was called Operation Popeye, weaponized weather during the Vietnam War. So that's already four plus decades there, James. One last related, I think, sets up our second story this week quite well but it still relates back to the, the weather weaponization. And it's from Zero Hedge. CIA accuses Russia of manipulating the world's weather. So within this report, you see a sort of he said, she said, they're doing it, so we should too, and the back and the forth. So I find that a really interesting, again, James, I think is each, each week we sort of lay out, I think the context, but we also sort of come back again and again to sort of the main big, big devils, if you will. And a lot of times, you know, it's the big boogeyman of, of the West where, you know, the great Satan and Putin and other times he's looked at as a rock star or not. And, and, and again, we're, we're, we're left with no real leaders to, to look up to. So having said that, James, we'll move to our second story this week and we'll take it from Zero Hedge. Moscow-based security firm reveals biggest NSA-based backdoor exploit ever. Since 2001, a group of hackers dubbed the Equation Group by researchers from Moscow-based Kaspersky Lab have infected computers in at least 42 countries, Iran, Russia, Pakistan, Afghanistan, India, Syria, with the most infected. In what Ars Technica calls, quote, superhuman technical feats, indicating extraordinary skill and unlimited resources. These exploits, including the prized technique of creating a, a secret storage vault that survives military-grade disk wiping and reformatting, 
and it covers every hard drive manufacturer and have many similar characteristics to the infamous NSA-led Stuxnet virus. So, according to Kaspersky, the spies made a technological breakthrough by figuring out how to lodge malicious software in the obscure code called firmware. Folks have probably run into that before, and it's the kind of thing I think novice or average computer users will run into and go, oh, geez, that's over my head. I'm not going to mess with that. So, firmware, it launches every time the computer's turned on. This drive firmware viewed by spies and cybersecurity experts as the second most valuable real estate on a computer for a hacker, second only to the BIOS code, which is invoked automatically every time a computer boots up. Lead Kaspersky researcher Kostin Ryu said in an interview, quote, the hardware will be able to infect the computer over and over. Kaspersky's reconstructions of the spying program show that they could work in this drive sold by more than a dozen companies comprising essentially the entire market. They include, as I keep showing you, Western Digital, Seagate, Toshiba, IBM, Micron, Samsung, and more. The group used a variety of means to spread other spying programs, such as by compromising jihadist websites, infecting USB sticks and CDs, and developing a self-spreading computer worm called Fanny. Fanny was like Stuxnet in that it exploited two of the same undisclosed software flaws known as, known as Zero Days, which strongly suggest collaboration by the authors, the authors of Fanny, the authors of Stuxnet. Ryu added that it was quite possible that the Equation Group used Fanny to scout out targets for Stuxnet in Iran and spread that virus, which, as Reuters reports, strongly suggests the extraordinary skills and unlimited resources were funded by the NSA. James, this this has been a pretty massive story this week, and even and, and a lot to go through. And again, like we'll always say, we leave all the notes, we give you all the links, you have to go do more research for yourself. But it's interesting how even in the description, we go from talking about compromising jihadist websites, which sounds like, oh, we're doing it to fight the terrorist, and it's also on your hard drive that's on your desk to hold some crappy MP3s, James. Exactly right. And, and think of that, that, uh, that range of activities that are made possible by these types of hacks. Um, and, and let's tie that in with a completely different story that's also being reported at the moment. Bank hackers steal millions via malware. Talking about the same Kaspersky lab that was investigating what is being called one of the greatest bank heists in history, although no one even knew it was happening when it was happening. Basically, uh, talking about this this uh, cyber gang that managed to uh, inject malware into various banking computer systems in multiple financial institutions around the world, but mostly in Russia, interestingly, and uh, basically they were able to pilfer hundreds of millions maybe as much as a billion dollars out the back door of these banks without the banks even really knowing what was happening when it was happening. Uh, a pretty amazing thing to achieve. And if you read about how that was done and the type of operation, I mean, this was not just some script kiddies. This was a very, very detailed and complex operation. And we've talked about it before. Let's talk about it again. In this world of cyber terrorism and cyber false flags and cyber criminals, again, the only information we have about these attacks is what the authorities will release about them. And again, how do we know that that type of banking heist that was going on behind the scenes wasn't being perpetrated by someone in the NSA or some other shadowy agency like that, maybe in the US or any other agency around the world, in order to fund black black ops operations in, in other fields or whatever? Again, all of this is completely, I mean... They can say that it's some sort of Russian mafia thing or something, but again, how do we know that at all? Um, so it, this just opens up that huge box. And if it if this type of story talking about the, the 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 equation group and what they've been doing does anything at all, I hope it at least undermines the faith that I unfortunately a lot of people still have in these big tech giant companies that, oh, if you buy, you know, whatever, Western Digital or, or Toshiba or something, well, this is this is going to be sound and safe. No, maybe it'll, it has hidden back doors and, and things implanted in it, and you don't really know about that. So if it does anything, I hope it gets us to decentralize a little bit and start thinking about how we have to actually um, start creating uh, our own 
alternative options and start going with other things that are completely off of the the radar of these these types of hacks like uh, raspberry pis and things to try to create an alternative infrastructure that we've talked about a lot but again that's the only way to move forward with this rather than consolidating all this control in the hands of a few tech giants that are really working hand in hand with the nsa anyway We'll include a PDF, a handy-dandy questions and answers breakdown on the equation group. And James, even as we're talking about this, we're knowingly – we're they're acknowledging the fact that our, our Western intelligence services are knowingly hacking and attacking other sovereign nations. But yet two months ago, we were all wringing our hands and freaking out about the Sony hack and who – oh, my God, and the, the sky is falling – and even today, as, as we're talking, James, we've got Barry Satoro going on television talking about we're going to go to war against ISIS, the guys we funded and created to fight those other enemies. And the fake left is for it, and the fake right is for it, and the fake press is all about promoting it. And I think hopefully in some way we'll try and be and continue to be some kind of antidote to that, James. Let's, let's, let's move to story three is how I'll get worked up. And in a way, I think we've continued to try and do good news. And I think that's a way that we distinguish ourselves from, from a lot of the noise and a lot of the garbage going on. So a nice way to, to kick off our good news notes on this week. You can now find out if U.S. spies passed on your data to U.K. spies. So following a landmark U.K. decision ruling certain mass surveillance practices were illegal, a privacy group has simplified the process of demanding to know if your rights were violated, James. You're able to, to, to petition the court to, to find out if you've been spied upon. Are you going to fill it out? Uh, well, I, I, I'm not sure how amazingly good that news is. I mean, I guess it's a step forward, but uh, I'd prefer to see I'd prefer to see more fundamental changes going on. But uh, but yes, I mean, I suppose we can now at least know about or a little bit more about how we're being spied on, which again will hopefully wake up a few more people. Let me throw a couple other good news next week notes at you. See if you like these better. More Icelandic bankers are going to jail. How about that? I very much like the idea of that. When you look into the story, you find out that it's these uh, four bankers associated with this shady deal where basically a bank was trying to cover up the fact that it was it was trying to do some tr stock tr manipulation of itself. And, uh, and so these guys got about four or five years jail, something like that um, each. And uh, it's not enough, not narrowly enough, given the scope of what's happened. But at the very least, Iceland is prosecuting its banksters. Um, hey, the rest of the world, here's an example. It can be done. So here's, here's some other good news notes, James. Croatia to write off debt for its poorest. Marijuana legalization proposal advances here in the U.S. in the state of New Mexico. And Nestle ditches their artificial bits in their U.S. chocolate, which made my partner Cassie note, oh, God, now I feel so much better about Nestle controlling the world's water supply because they'll throw us some crumbs and tell us they're taking out the artificial bits in their already not free trade and not organic, you know, monopoly chocolate, if you will. A uh, columnist resigns from The Telegraph stating, quote, the coverage of HSBC in Britain's Daily Telegraph is a fraud on its readers. And James, a lot of these good news stories in a way are follow-ups and updates to stories that we do follow week in, week out for folks here on New World Next Week. And just the last thing I want to note, it's been kind of an interesting day here in Oregon as we've had our governor resign last Friday, the 13th. And most of the headlines around, or at least on places like Drudge and even from other places like Counterpunch, noted Oregon's governor undone by green schemes. And we'll include an article from Counterpunch called Green Crony Capitalism, Oregon's ex-governor and the green wash grifters. This is essentially where our now ex-governor let his fiance peddle influence within the office of the governor so that she could funnel money to her pet green projects, which, if you know anything about Oregon, is like shooting ducks in a barrel because we're all about trying to be green at, at any cost. So I think it's a really uh, an interesting story. And in a way, James, maybe this is something we could probably should probably get into in some other avenue. I see the story of her name's Sylvia Hayes is, is the one who's probably going to jail for taking down, in a way, her fiancé, the ex-governor of Oregon, John Kitzhaber. 
I almost see her in some way as some type of analogy to the stories we've just discussed in some way. You're taking some, someone who, who sees an interest or a, a situation or something that has real uh, reality to it, that, whether that's environment or, or, or technology or what have you, and exploiting that and exploiting fears and exploiting the money, which is essentially the answer to 99 out of 100 questions. I, I see in some way the Sylvia Hayes story as a, as a microcosm to what we see going on in, in the larger world. And so I think ultimately what we say all the time, it's like, yes, your governments are corrupt, your banks, your schools, your churches. It's all completely corrupt. And the fastest, best thing we can do is to completely withdraw our consent and our actions with those. Watch those things crumble and hopefully we can build something else in, in its place, James. That's a rather lofty way to end this. <laughs> it is, but it's, like, again, a noble goal. And I think what we have to be striving towards and let's do it both at the same time, withdraw our consent in one system and put our energy and time into building up the other system. I think both are uh, the yin and the yang of what we need to be doing. At any rate, that is a big topic. And I'm sure in many ways, it's what we cover here every single week. So let's continue to cover it. Thank you so much once again for three great stories. I'm uh, looking forward to it again next, not next week. I'm going to be in Mexico. So (laughs) a couple of weeks from now, we'll, we'll be back. Thank you again. You know, I think that, and what you're doing, you're, you're going to Anarchapulco. That's sort of, again, building, building the things that we want to see. And I commend you for being involved in that. It's, it's great that you now get to kind of go and travel around and see that. And again, kind of spread the things that we, in a microcosm, try and go out on a, on a macrocosm, James. So once again, man, thank you so much. Okay, now, that was James Evan Pilato, based here in Portland, Oregon. So um, there's a lot of really good sources for information, and it's interesting that we went out on that uh, Governor Kitzhaber story and, you know, how it's a microcosm of the generalized, cross-the-board corruption everywhere you look. And here's a, a, a couple of stories. I'm going to announce them both now. I, I it depends on how much time we have left, whether I'll be back or not. But the first story is about Coca-Cola. Okay, now they got me addicted to it, and I don't like that. And I've been cutting down. I'm down to about, oh, maybe 1% of what I was at the peak of my addiction. So I'm, I'm winning. But uh, Coca-Cola got caught cheating again. They, they've been paying doctors to suggest that drinking Coca-Cola is healthy for you. Okay, and in the second story, uh, we, we've we got uh, the New York Police Department going to Wikipedia, not WikiLeaks. WikiLeaks is, is more legitimate. Wikipedia is the uh, one that you can change at will. And the New York Police Department admitted changing some key stories about recent killings okay so let's just go ahead and we'll go into these and if i don't see you right away i'll see you next week now most of you are aware that soda is a major source of usually unwanted calories big names like former new york city mayor mike bloomberg have tried to wrangle in the consumption even the first lady michelle obama has spoken out against drinking it it's full of chemicals corn syrup and other artificial sweeteners Coca-Cola has specifically come under lots of social scrutiny for some other unintended results like this here being used as a toilet bowl cleaner or others showing how Coke can clean your jewelry, pennies, even the engine in your car. Now, between the countless YouTube Coke experiments that now anyone can post to the web, Coca-Cola Corp has decided to combat that once precious and expensive online user impression by hiring nutritionists, dietitians, doctors, and other health experts to blog, YouTube, and flat out recommend their sugary drink to people. Now, it doesn't matter if you're in America or any other part of the world. The web has made Coca-Cola's influence universal and the message of their paid health experts accessible to all. According to Coca-Cola, they're sold in over 200 countries in the world, so it's nearly physically impossible to escape them. They estimate that we consume nearly 2 billion of their sodas every single day, and that earns them around 5 billion bucks every quarter, 3 billion of which is spent on advertising annually. 
So it's no wonder then, with that kind of advertising budget, that they can spend a few bucks on paying registered dietitians with big blog followings to mention that their mini cans of Coke could actually be good for you, citing that those mini cans are only 90 calories and can aid in portion control as well as simply curing that sweet tooth craving. Now, Coca-Cola spokesman Ben Schiedler told press that paying for those types of mentions is no different than product placement of their drinks in a movie or a TV show. Now, ironically, if you think you can skirt around the calories by drinking a diet soda, think again. While that might work for you right now when you're younger, a new study published in the American Journal of Geriatric Society found a direct link to prolonged consumption of diet soda. It revealed a greater amount of abdominal obesity and or increased levels of belly fat in adults aged 65 years or older. Now, the findings also raised some concerns about the greater risk of cardiovascular disease and metabolic syndrome. Sorry, diet soda drinkers. Even that will catch up with you someday. In Washington, Manila Chan, RT. If you want to get basic information about anything, you may go to Wikipedia page. The problem is that its entries can be altered by just about anybody. And that is the case which happened to the text right above me on the page describing the death of Eric Garner. Now, you'll be surprised to know where these changes came from. Allegedly, the investigation held by the Capital New York website traced the IP addresses of people who made those changes back to the headquarters of the New York Police Department. Now, the original line suggesting that Garner raised both his arms before being put in a chokehold by the police officer was changed to Eric Garner flailing his arms about before being put in a headlock. And also, so a line saying Garner, who was considerably larger than any of the officers, continued to struggle with them, despite uh, the video evidence suggesting the opposite. And probably this line was added to sort of justify the actions of the NYPD officer. Now, another change in this particular article came in the line where um, the EMTs and paramedics responded to Garner as it was said originally, after he was put in the chokehold. Well, this line was changed to Garner's respiratory distress. Now, there have been other notable changes in Wikipedia articles related to NYPD involving uh, different shootings and scandals surrounding the police department. But the other notable change came in the article about the match malign stop and frisk policy of the NYPD, which was all but abolished by uh, the uh, new mayor, D Bill de Blasio. Uh, well, in this article, in the original version, it's described the stop and frisk program as a practice of the New York City Police Department to stop, question and search people. Well, the search people part was replaced by if the circumstances of the stop warranted, conduct a frisk of the person stopped. It's unclear what the motivation is of those changes and the um, you know, Capital New York website reported that uh, those changes uh, can be dated back to, to year 2008. Now the NYPD uh, official spokesperson says that this will be investigated, that those responsible for those alterations will be found. And meanwhile, all the entries, all the altered entries on Wikipedia have been brought back to their original versions. Alexei Roshevsky, RT, reporting from New York City.